well, let's let's crack on and do the admin first while people are dialing in please gary if we can have the okay. first slide okay so welcome everyone thank you for dialing in so promptly um i'll introduce our speaker today you're i inspector in just a minute but just while we're waiting for last last minute to, to dial in um you'll see on the screen um the uh, the black bar towards the bottom of the screen going across if you wiggle your prompt your your uh, pointer at any time over the screen the black bar will come up and that's your instructions for those who haven't used zoom before that's your instructions to allow you to communicate with the speaker and with the uh, hosts so um, you can see on there right in the middle of the black bar is a chat function if you click on the chat function just once you'll open up the zoom group chat box which is shown above and the zoom group chat box allows you to type a message uh, typically a question or comment uh, under the uh, blue box saying everyone so you can type your message there and send it in and um, Gary and I will receive it and we'll be able to moderate questions and comments coming in uh, and feed them through to your um, at the end of this talk uh, we've agreed that questions and comments would be uh, given to your at the end of his talk rather than throughout just so uh, he achieves some continuity in his comments so uh, please don't be disappointed if your questions aren't asked straight away uh, and at the end we may not be able to get through all the questions but we'll get through as many as we can so that's a quick run through of the practicalities if everyone's happy with that uh, I'll, I'll crack on and introduce today's speaker with just a couple of other comments so first of all, um, welcome to Dr. Yoram Inspector. It's my absolute delight on behalf of Redline group members, and we may also have some uh, JPouch UK specific Facebook group people dialing in. And we may also have some members from our sister charity, the Kangaroo Club in Oxford, all of whom have been informed of this webinar. Uh, but um, all of us have, or are intending to have, or uh, are related to, or indeed, <laughs> Uh, friends who have a pouch and that's our common uh, membership group so um, we're absolutely delighted to have you back again it was our privilege to have you speak at an information day two or three years ago and you've got some outstanding feedback I think one of the features um, uh, you're an inspector I should add is consultant psychiatrist and psychotherapist at St Mark's Hospital and he's head of the psychological medical unit at St Mark's there's a couple of things that uh, Yoram has mentioned in the past which are really interesting uh, for me and I'm sure for many others and that's the existence of what he terms the brain gut axis the connection between the brain and the gut uh, hopefully he'll be uh, speaking a bit more about that today and secondly um, I think the the principle of treating when we treat patients uh, with IBD the principle of treating the person and uh, rather than just the body and I think that's uh, something that came out of this talk several years ago so maybe maybe uh, he'll be talking about that today uh, but anyway um, uh, you're an inspector we're delighted to have you join us and uh, without further ado I'll hand over to you to talk about psychological support to you all uh, I'm really grateful um, uh, to be given the opportunity to share with you um, what I experienced uh, in, in my work during the last 10 years at St. Mark's trying to support a, a patients who uh, are on the IBD journey. Um, th there might be just one second of break because at 11, I might be receiving just a, a phone call that I couldn't uh, postpone. So I'll just maybe say, I'll talk to you in half an hour, but maybe it won't come. So this is only one apology. Um, but like, like I said, I would like to speak about um, the experience of supporting uh, people with IBD. And that's why I chose um, as my, uh, in my title, the word support. And I elaborate a bit about what support means as you can see on the screen it's a sort of a juxtaposition of uh, three images uh, you see on the right you see the inflamed uh, uh, um, intestine in ibd 
Uh, on the left, you see Psyche. Uh, Psyche was a princess in Greek mythology who had butterfly wings. And I think uh, it's not a coincidence that our Psyche is called after her because the Psyche is very butterfly-ish, very elusive. You cannot really find it. Um, and um, it, it's a metaphor probably that for what happens in, in the brain, although uh, the psyche probably is more than the sum of the parts of, of our body. And I like the, the, the butterfly. Uh, you know, the expression to feel your butterflies, to feel butterflies in your stomach. So this is a, a daily expression that actually embodies the connection between the psyche, the butterfly, and the, and the intestine. Uh, the problem in psychiatry is that uh, you have all sorts of diagnoses and numbers which sometimes feel like putting needles in the butterfly. So you define what it is, but then you kill the butterfly. By the way, psychotherapy is therapy in Greek means to serve the butterfly, to serve. So psychotherapy is serving the butterfly. And it's very, very uh, um, difficult to serve a butterfly while keeping its movement and aliveness. You know, it reminded me that in one of Bruce Lee uh, films, Entering the Dragon, and I, in the last five years, immersed myself a lot in Tai Chi, uh, he's asked by his master, the Shaolin master, what's, what's the best fighting technique? And Bruce Lee says, not to have a fighting technique. Because once you're rigid in a certain fighting technique, you won't be open to the new situation that will come towards you. And also your enemy will be able to predict what you're gonna do. But when I compare it to psychotherapy, uh, you can say as a martial art or coping with IBD as a martial art, nothing prepares me to the new person I meet. Yes, people have maybe the same uh, 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 findings in the colon or the small intestine, but nobody is the same. Each one is unique with a unique, unique history, with a unique dream, with a unique uh, way of perceiving what's going on in their body. And the, 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 the work is to individually tailor the support to the person uh, and sometimes my support is by writing a letter to uh, support benefits or writing to the uh, uh, um, workplace to say, to explain why the patient is late every morning because he suffers from his IBD that he was ashamed to disclose to his employee. Um, so the, 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 the support is, is unique to the person. And at the... At the middle, there is this beautiful painting of Francisco Goya, uh, the Spanish painter that portrayed him with his doctor during a period that he was nearly dying and became deaf and, and uh, was walking actually in the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, and you can see behind the picture all these shadowy uh, uh, people there. And you see the support. Um, you know, the hug, the glass of water, sometimes things that we forgot to do in the politically corrected word uh, that, uh, you know, um, the, the, the basics of, of the support. And this is a, a beautiful image of what actually everyone needs uh, symbolically, but sometimes even concretely. Just a second. Next slide, yeah. So, um, I made myself a habit to start my presentation with this image, that after I discovered it, it uh, really excited me so much uh, that I really made, made it a sort of a icon and it actually is hanging above my desk in the office. Um, so I don't know if you know who that is, and maybe I presented it in the last presentation. But this face is the face of uh, Hambaba. It is found in the, you can find it in the British Museum. And Hambaba is called also the intestine face like God. 
So you can see very clearly here, I don't know if you see my mouse, the, the intestine on his face, and you can actually say that his whole face is like a labyrinth-like intestine. And for me, this is the, the most ancient uh, uh, image that actually tells us that our ancestors knew that the head and the gut are one thing, that you cannot separate them. This is found in the myth of Gilgamesh. The myth of Gilgamesh is the oldest story known to man that was found in stone in the area of Mesopotamia, Iraq, uh, 2,000 years before Christ. It's more ancient than the, than the Bible. And, and um, if you want to read one good story that actually encompasses everything you need to know in life, read the myth of Gilgamesh. So in the myth of Gilgamesh, it's the story between, uh, about Gilgamesh, who was a very arrogant ruler, uh, sort of a very ancient Donald Trump, that uh, uh, thought, you know, he's a semi-god, and actually he was uh, two-thirds divine and one-third an animalistic. Uh, and everything was perfect in the city of Uruk that he ruled, but people were very oppressed, and he had this nasty habit to uh, order uh, every woman before she gets married to come to his bed. He had the right on the first night. So all the virgins of the country had to come to him first before being with the husband. And he couldn't stand it anymore. So they asked him, they asked the gods to humble him. So then uh, the, the, the gods agree and create a friend to uh, uh, Gilgamesh who never had real relationship with other people. He was so isolated in his ivory tower. And the person they choose is called Inkidu, which is two-thirds an animal, animalistic, and one-third divine. But you remind me, Gilgamesh is two-thirds divine and one-third animalistic. So it's fascinating that 2,000 years before Christ, people were trying to find this union between body and mind. Uh, then they become friends. And then as two machos, they decide they want to kill a monster. And they go and kill Hambaba, who was the guardian of the holy cedar forest. They shouldn't have done it. No reason to do that. Um, but they do it, and because of that, the, 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 the gods punish Gilgamesh by a, an Inkidu, by making Inkidu die. And then Gilgamesh faces the inevitability of death and faces the inevitability of not being able to help his friend when he thought he was almighty before. And this really humbles him and transforms him and, and makes him more humane. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, when Enkidu, uh, before he meets Gilgamesh, he initiated into being human by lovemaking uh, during seven days and seven with the holy prostitute of Ishtar, the, the, the mother goddess, because at that time, uh, the prostitute in the temple had the holy mission to help people to be reconnected with their body. So um, it's interesting how these ancient people knew that body and mind are one. And as you can see, this image of Baba gives you a palpable image of this unity. Interestingly, in Judaism, the, the most holy prayer is, uh, listen, Israel, our God is one God. There is this unity of body and mind. And this can be illustrated by a quote of a patient of mine with ulcerative colitis that actually had a colectomy in a pouch formed. And he told me losing my colon felt like losing a part of my mind. Uh, which is a striking uh, 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 sentence, but it just tells me how people are somehow have a feeling of their intestine as part of their own, and suddenly when this part is not there, you feel that you lost something. And I always make this distinction between to know about something and to know something. To know about is an intellectual knowledge. To know is to experience it. And this is something that really guides me in my work. For me, the patient is the one who knows because the patient experiences it. 
especially with pain and with all these opaque symptoms that nobody can see in an x-ray. So um, this, this is a, a, an example from experience regarding the brain-gut connection. Uh, this is a, a, a nice sentence in a, in a poem of an Israeli poet, which is called Brain, and he says, the brain does not resemble anything else in the world except perhaps the small intestine. And uh, I juxtapose the small intestine here with the brain, and you can see that it's, it's very similar. Yeah? Uh, there is even a theory that the, the, the gut is actually the first intestine. Uh, and then, um, then, then the, the, the brain, the other brain developed. So um, I was working uh, uh, in the field of eating disorders before I came to and, um, and um, you know, sometimes not only me, not, not, not only I don't know what I'm exactly doing, uh, uh, but also the, the, the GPs that refer to me don't know how really to digest me. Yeah? So I received these referrals such as, a, a doctor inspector, gut psychiatrist, uh, St. Mark's Hospital. So, uh, by the way, inspector is my real surname. I didn't create it. Uh, one of the ancestors uh, of, of my family in Poland or Ukraine probably was an inspector of some sort in the police or maybe less heroically an inspector for kosher food. Uh, but uh, uh, this is why I get these other referrals, Dr. Yoram, inspector psychiatrist for IBS, yeah? uh, but, but this actually really demonstrates the, a very serious point. Like the Ukrainian uh, uh, proverb says, in every joke there's only 10% of a joke, so 90% of truth. Um, so uh, obviously we don't treat the gut and we don't treat IBS. We, we, we help a person who has gut problems, a person who has a, 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 a IBS. And I thought a few times uh, during these 10 years, what actually I'm doing in St. Mark, what's, if I need to summarize it in one sentence, what it is, then I came with this answer that the work is to help people to feel that their gut problems that overwhelms them, overwhelms them, that is so central to their lives, is something that they have but it does not define them who, who, it doesn't define who they are. And to create this, this internal distance between, okay, this is something I cope with, but it's not who I am. Because sometimes you forget when it's so bad, you, you cannot feel any other aspects of yourself. And that's why in the conversations I have with people, okay, I focus on the gut, but I look at the whole life and the, the uh, beliefs and aspiration and dreams and who they are just actually to create this feeling that uh, 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 you know uh, it's something that you have but it's not something that defines who you are so actually work in the field that is called the psychosomatic field yeah uh, psyche and, and soma the body and i created um a new term to myself, uh, I don't know if somebody created it before me, I didn't patent it, but I, I, I called it somatopsychic uh, because I, the, the opening sentence uh, for me when I meet people became, I really apologize that you had to see a psychiatrist. So the fact that you see me doesn't mean that you're mad. Let's take it out of the way because to be referred to as psychiatrist, you know, uh, your gut started to behave madly, and obviously, if our gut starts to behave madly, it will madden everyone. And allegedly, I'm an expert on madness, so you meet me, but don't worry about it. And I truly believe in it because sometimes it starts from bottom up, but also sometimes the upper part affects the lower part. And um, we talk about it. Interestingly, there was a, a nurse, I don't know if you, you, know, you knew him, in Frederick Salmon Ward, uh, Steve who, when I uh, came to see patients on the ward, he always asked me, so uh, try to find out if it's loft or plumbing. 
you know, uh, uh, and we call it the LP index, you know. And he said to me, I think it's a, a, a 80% loft and 20% plumbing. And I used to come back to him and I said, no, 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 no. It's 90% plumbing and 10% loft, you know. But um, I, I chose these two beautiful images of these two uh, 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 painters to demonstrate what I did. So on the left, you can see the angel supporting Jacob, uh, the beautiful Rembrandt painting. And if the angel is the, the psyche, the winged psyche, uh, this is what we try to, to, to develop, a sort of a compassionate attitude of the psyche towards the body. Because when these awful things happen in our body, we hate the body, we want it to get rid of it, we cannot stand it. And, and how actually to embrace it in a sort of a compassion means to suffer with. And, and contain it and, and see actually what sometimes what he tries to tell us and how to approach it. So this is the psyche, psychosomatic and somatopsychic. Uh, this is a, a beautiful, on the right, uh, the beautiful picture of a, a, a Finnish artist called Hugo Stimberg. It's called the wounded angel. And, and you can see these two boys helping this wounded angel so for me, it's also an image that represents the need to strengthen the body in order to support the wounded psyche. And we all know that when we start to feel physically better, you know, it has a, a tremendous So it's always both sides, from both, uh, 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 from both sides of this dual courage way. Okay. So when I try to uh, uh, define uh, the, the psychological uh, medicine unit in, in the annual book, or, or if I need to write to, found to, the, to the CCGs, I found myself this definition. The psychological medicine unit of St. Mark's Hospital uh, uh, provides a psychiatric and psychological treatment and support to patients who suffer from various gastrointestinal diseases and disorders. So, for example, uh, um, um, just a second. Um, I was trying to, because I could not see the, yeah. So, so for example, this is a typical referral letter. Uh, dear Dr. Inspector, I would be grateful if you could see uh, Mr. K, 70 years old, who has been suffering from Crohn's disease since he was 20. He also experienced a steroid-induced psychosis when firstly treated with prednisolone, is currently very low in mood as he suffers from unbearable pain, most likely due to his progressive disease. His current mood and physical state are seriously affecting his quality of life as well as impacting on his family. He was suggested treatment with infliximab for his progressive Crohn's disease, but he's hesitating whether to start the drug due to a mixture of factors, including his self-defense mechanisms, previous medication side effects, medical history, which also affected his mood and mental state. He is now at the crossroad where your support, and I put the word support in bold letters, will be crucial for his holistic care and for medical treatment. Yours sincerely, I uh, don't know if you know her, uh, Gabriela, the IBD specialist dietitian from St. Mark's, and I, I put it just to show that her soulful approach and the real holistic way that we try to aspire to in St. Mark's that actually everyone uh, are working together as a, as a team. So the word support. I'm, I'm focusing on this because I had an argument with a, a psychologist in our team that actually said to me, I don't think we, use, we should use the word support in our definition. Because we are a, a tertiary specialized service, we are professionals, support is a very general term. A, a social worker can support you, your aunt can support you, you know. And I actually took a deep breath and um, I said, actually, if I need to leave only one word of all this convoluted text, I will leave the word support. And for your information, I will give you the historical context and the etymology of the word support. So the word support 
uh, uh, comes from the late 14th century to hold up, prop up, put up with tolerance. Uh, it also comes from supportare in Latin, which means to carry uh, and to hold sub from under, from underneath, which I said to her, it's very suitable for gastroenterology actually, because we support bottom up. Uh, and, uh, and actually support as, as um, also um, means uh, services which enable something to fulfill its function and remain in operation. So I said, this is actually what we do. And the historical context of the word support comes from this place, uh, uh, the Esclapion, which was the temple uh, uh, where uh, uh, Esclapius, the god of medicine, was, uh, was performing his healing uh, 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 um, powers. And people came to this place to be healed. So when you came, uh, to the Esclepion, first of all, they would give you a nice bath with all sorts of herbs and, 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 and scents and not, not really what you get when you come to the A&E nowadays. Uh, and then they would send you to a, a, a room to have a dream because they, they thought that dreams are really communications from gods that are important. And then in the morning, the Sapporos, that comes from the word support, came and physically supported you and took you in front of Esclapion, Esclapius, the god of medicine. And the idea was, we support and God heals. So actually the healing takes place in a sort of a miraculous godly world. And what we can give is this support, which is essential for the healing process to take place. And I really like this approach, this humble approach, that we do what we can, but, and we pray that the God of medicine, nature, the God that we believe us will, will, will help. Also, I said to this psychologist that one of the most important people in medicine was initiated into medicine uh, um, in this temple. And he was no other than Hippocrates. Uh, that we sw swear by his oath when we become doctors. And Hippocrates said three things. He said, you cure, you get rid of the problem completely rarely. You give therapy, you make things better frequently, and you must comfort always, which is something that sometimes is forgotten in modern medicine. He also said, be interested in the person who has the disease as much as you're interested in the disease that the person has. Yeah? And, and which is obviously very important. And the last thing he said, first of all, do no harm, which is very important. So I said to her, I hope that by now you understand why the word support is important. And she actually said to me, um, Thank you for your email, but I found it rather aggressive. So, and then I said to her, this is not aggress aggressive, this is assertive. And uh, we continue to talk about it and the word support stays. So what people need to be supported with uh, in IBD, and I feel really embarrassed to tell you about it because you know about it. Uh, I, I, experienced kidney stones and other problems, but I, I didn't experience yet a, a IBD. But uh, for me, uh, I created this image uh, that I call it the Medusa of IBD. And uh, Medusa, as you can see, she was a woman with snakes in her hair in the Greek mythology. This is the only uh, a, a sculpture that shows that Medusa is suffering. Generally, she's portrayed as a monstrous, frightening uh, woman with snakes in her head that when you come towards her, you become petrified, turn into stone. Uh, why is she suffering? Because actually Medusa was a victim of rape. Uh, she was a, a, a priestess in the temple of Athena, the goddess of wisdom. 
and uh, she was raped by Poseidon, the god of the sea, in the temple. And, and uh, Poseidon represents the feelings, the sea, Athena, represents the mind. So they are always in, in this battle between the mind and the body. And because when she, after she was raped, Athena blamed her for seducing Poseidon, which is not uncommon still to blame women who are victims of rape in seducing men. And she tell, told her, because you did it, you will turn into this woman and everyone that will come towards you will turn into stone. Will be petrified. Petrus means stone. So very cruel. But for me, this is an image of the loneliness of the post who cannot really tell fully what you experience because other people will turn into stone. They will not be able to, to tolerate this story. And I think there is a lot of loneliness in IBD because many of the symptoms are not something that you want to share with people. They're not the nicest symptoms. Uh, I'll speak about shame in, in a minute and the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, you're less ashamed to speak about asthma or a cough or an itch, but to speak about fecal incontinence or, or flatulence or, or pain or bloody diarrhea is not something that you really openly share with people. Unfortunately, we need maybe to change it and to take the shame out of these symptoms, but there is a, 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 a real loneliness. And then there are all these snakes that you are being petrified by pain, fear of cancer, fear of surgery, isolation, fatigue, fecal incontinence, rectal bleeding, fear of a stoma bag, a pouch, side effect of steroid and other immunosuppressants. And these, these snakes, or these things that petrifies us, cause depression, which is actually the most common a, a psychological just a second, I need to take this call, yeah? Just a second. You're muted at the moment, Yura. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. I apologize, this was the call I was afraid this will come and it did come. No problem. I gave them warning not to call at this time, but okay. So, so I spoke about what happens when we face all these things. Uh, uh, the depression, is, is actually the most common uh, uh, problem that is found with people in IBD at some stage. And depression is caused by three things, feeling worthless, hopeless, and helpless. Yeah, worthlessness, helplessness, and hopelessness. So worthless, it says, okay, what am I worth if I have this and I cannot work, I'm so fatigued, I'm bleeding, I'm in pain, uh, uh, all these medications, you know, I'm, I'm nothing really. Helplessness, what can I do about it? There's nothing can be done. These tsunamis of these flare-ups will happen anyhow. Uh, there's nothing I can do. And hopelessness is, it won't get better, yeah? And when we fall into this pit of these three snakes, we become depressed. And the psychological work is to, to fight the worthlessness and to say again, this is something that you have. It doesn't define who you are. You do that, you do that, you do that, just to try. And also that these are feelings like waves. You know, they, at some point they will go away. Helplessness, there's a lot we can do. The support groups, uh, uh, the, the information, the new medications, you know, and, and hope, you know, uh, uh, we, sp we speak about it, uh, uh, from where hope came to the world, I'll leave it to the end. Uh, uh, Hope is so important, you know. How do you know that nothing will uh, become better? You meet other people that actually succeeded in their journey and so on. Um, and interestingly, a, a new finding that actually speaking about depression in, in, in IBD, there is even a, 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 a theory that actually says that chronic inflammation may play a causative role in depression. So actually, the inflammation itself causes depression in the brain. There is a whole book called The Inflamed Brain. A, a, for example, chronic intestinal inflammation may result in decreased sensitivity to positive emotions in fMRI studies. 
So actually the inflammation itself makes you more depressed. It's not maybe your fault or the way you think, it's actually a physical thing that happens. So this is also, because we don't know really what contributes to what, it's also important to, 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 to notice that. And when we deal with trauma, it's very common to blame ourselves because if it's our fault, we are in control over it and we just need to t change something and we will feel differently. Yeah? So, so obviously, it's not our fault. Many times it happens. Let's see what we can do about it to improve it. But also this piece of information can redeem people a bit from also to be blamed by their depression. Sometimes it's maybe the physical thing in the body. And this is quite a new theory. Anxiety. Anxiety is a major uh, 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 problem in IBD. Uh, and anxiety is made of two things, uncertainty and the fear of irreversibility. So you don't know what will happen and something will happen that will be irreversible. And um, this is a quote from somebody with Crohn's disease. Uh, uh, I feel that having Crohn's is like living with an unexploded time bomb chained around my neck. You never know when it is going to go off. You only know that it will go off. Sometimes I wonder if it's worth all the pain and effort to get better only to go through this recurring nightmare at a later stage. Interestingly, this quote, I found it in a book uh, called Working Therapeutically with Clients with Inflammatory D uh, Disease, Gillian Thomas, PhD. And what's unique about Gillian Thomas is she's a sufferer of IBD. And she became a, 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 a therapist, a, a psychotherapist, because of her experience when she was ill, I think with ulcerative colitis, she came, she didn't know what it was, and there was this consultant that told her, no wonder that you suffer so much uh, because you're so preoccupied with these symptoms. Basically, get on with it and stop thinking about it all this time. And she said, until this day, I'm so shocked by this attitude that I decided I need to uh, help other people not to be exposed to this, 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 this attitude. And uh, based on the experience she had with a psych psychiatric social worker that then treated it in a completely uh, different way. Um, so anxiety is, is very central. And shame. I want to speak some really about shame because uh, I mentioned it before. Uh, I had a patient that actually had fecal incontinence in Tesco and he just went to the street and wanted the, a bus to run him over. Luckily, the bus stopped. But actually, this is something, this is the face and image of shame. You want to disappear. You want the earth to swallow you. You hide your face. Uh, uh, and, you know, sometimes I want to go on a campaign to redeem the gastrointestinal system from shame. Why? Fecal incontinence is more shameful than sneezing, you know, or, or I don't know, coughing, or why this area is considered dirty. This is something I think to, to work on, and I'll come at the end of the talk to this. This is really loved by Ann Patchett, an American uh, uh, writer. She, shared, she said, shame should be reserved for things we choose to do, not the circumstances that life puts on us. So actually, I think if you steal money from somebody who sells big issue, I think you should be ashamed of yourself. But if fecal incontinence happened to you, you might feel embarrassed and you might feel shame, but you shouldn't shame yourself. And, but, but shame is very, very, a very difficult feeling. They found out, interestingly, this is a, a, a research from Journal of American Medical Association. They ask people who are palliative, actually they're, they're about to die at some stage, 180 patients with serious illness. 
and they were asked what could be worse than death. And they were given a, 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 a long list of symptoms. Rely on breathing machine to live, cannot get to, out to bed, confused all the time, need care all the time, rely on feeding tube to live, live in a nursing home, a home all day, moderate pain all time, in a wheelchair. Bowel and bladder incontinence scored the highest, worse than, worse than death. Yeah? For example, like relying on a breathing machine to live. So just it shows you how devastating this symptom is psychologically. So how do we actually help? What can we do to help to free us from this petrifying symptom? So actually we do it through reflection. And this takes me back to the myth of Medusa, which for me is one of the most important myths to demonstrate psychological work. Perseus wants to decapitate the head of Medusa because he wants to free his mother that was captivated by an evil king. Because the head, even after it's been cut, is, can still petrify people. So how will he do it? He will do it through the shield of Athena, who knows uh, 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 Medusa. And she said, when you approach her, uh, don't look at her directly. Look at her reflection. The reflection is not as powerful as the real gaze. So this is what he does. He looks at the reflection and he chops her head off. In the middle, you can see uh, the wonderful painting of Caravaggio in, in the Uffizi in Florence of the decapitated Medusa. And then something amazing happens. From the beheaded body of Medusa emerges Pegasus, the winged horse, that from the first place where he touches the ground, the creek of the muses appears, the creek that gave inspiration to all human uh, creativity. And I like Pegasus because it reminds me the, the winged lion of St. Mark's. And if you wrap it up, when you are able, through reflection, to overcome the petrifying power of the depression, anxiety, the shame, the post-traumatic stress disorder, all the insults, you can say, of the IBD, when you're able to reflect on it and not to be petrified by this, you release energy. You release the Pegasus energy that can help you to be creative in your journey and face the, the, the problems that you're going to face. So how actually the reflection in the therapy works? And I, I want to give you just a few examples. So for example, a 25-year-old patient with Crohn's disease had a severe anal pain, and he was referred to me because of suicidality. He said, I'm suicidal, I'm suicidal. They even thought about maybe sectioning him. And the patient says to me, I'm suicidal. And I ask him why. And the patient says, I cannot live with this pain. And I ask him, if you wouldn't have this pain, would you still want to kill yourself? And the patient tells me, are you mad? I have a great job, a wonderful girlfriend. Why I want to kill myself? And I said to him, so do yourself a favor. Stop saying to everybody that you are suicidal. Tell them that you want help with managing this pain so it can be compatible with life. So actually, when people say that they are suicidal, when I ask them, what do you think about death? Most of them don't want to die. They want to be pain-free. They want peace and quiet. So the reflection about the word suicidality actually helped. And then I said to him, Okay, a, a, the pain was caused because they treated wrongly the anal pain. They thought it's a, it's a fissure and it was actually undiagnosed IBD. So the, the surgical intervention made it work. And I said, okay, now you'll start the steroid, you'll start the biologics, the pain will be better. But you don't want to die, you want to have less pain. And this reflective act actually changed the way we worked and the way he behaved. So the professional reflection has all sorts of professional names, psychodynamic psychotherapy, psychodynamic interpersonal therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, mentalization based therapy, hypnotherapy, relaxation and mindfulness and EMDR, which is an eye movement, the sensitization and uh, uh, um, reprocessing. So, you know, PIT, ACT, CBT, MBT, 
in there are all these professional names, which are, are good treatments. But I actually try to find out what is it actually all about. And I'm not uh, uh, disregarding the benefits of these specific therapies, but I think that the essence is uh, uh, the support. So if you're interested in, in psychological aspects of IBD, this is a book uh, that was uh, uh, published in 2015, and uh, uh, Philip uh, Hendy and Professor Elsa Hart and myself wrote chapter 16 there, Standard Medical Care, Side Effects and Compliance, where we actually uh, uh, argued that the psychological work is essential to have a better compliance to treatment, because if you're in a better state of mind, you, you, you understand what's going on, you'll be more compliant. With, with the treatment and you'll be, become better. But it really is a comprehensive book. The first one that was written on this, uh, uh, you see IBD, uh, how the psyche is related to it, stress, distress in IBD, the microbiota. Interestingly, we know now that all these bacteria in the gut are really affecting our mind. Yeah, uh, um, so the, 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 the they, they found, they did an experiment with mice that when they were depressed and couldn't move and they were giving a probiotic, they started to be more active. So, so um, it's a biopsychosocial approach. So um, these in a way are all the psychological uh, problems that all the psychotherapists are trying to address. But basically, if I try to summarize what it's all about, I always say that it's about being the second mouse. And this needs a bit of explanation. Maybe I, you heard it in my last talk. This is an experiment that was done with mice by Henri Laborie. He was an amazing person because he was also a surgeon, but also a philosopher and, 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 a, and a very interested in psychology. And he did this experiment with mice. As a poor mice, but uh, it gave a very uh, important insight about stress and, and, and the gut. So uh, they took the mouse, put him in a cage, uh, gave him an electrical current that was dis distressing but not dangerous. The door of the cage was open, the mouse escapes, nothing happened to it. So if you can ex ex escape from a difficult situation, you'll be fine. If you can es escape from the IBD, it will be fine, but you cannot escape. Then. They, they took the mouse, put him in a cage, closed the door, gave him the same current that was disturbing but not dangerous. The mouse cannot escape, receives the current, and is alone. And this mouse starts to become ill, loses its hair, and also develops a peptic ulcer and starts to vomit blood. So it affects the, it affects the gut. Uh, but then they took two mice, put both of them in, in a, in, in, a, in a cage, gave both of them the current, so they could not escape, they received the current, but they were not alone. Nothing happened to them, they were okay. So if you have another mouse in your cage, you'll be better. This is all about support, the support groups, what we do now, meeting together, talking about it, not to be alone in the cage, is very, very important, physically, it's not just mentally. And this is why, you know, the, the painting of Goya, his, 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 his doctor was a very good mouse to him. Um, so, um, so, so this is really a, a key element. So, it's about uh, the patient that I was called to see, uh, he had um, ulcerative colitis and he actually came uh, uh, to, to St. Mark's uh, in order to create a pouch. But when they opened him during the, the, the surgery, they realized that um, in the other hospital, something went wrong and I don't know, he was not prepared properly and he didn't have enough intestine, a uh, small intestine to create the pouch. So they closed him and he, he woke up with, um, with a permanent stoma bag at the age of 21 while he was waiting to be told that the pouch was full. And he uh, actually uh, was very quiet and composed, but he said, I want to speak with a psychiatrist. And when I came, he told me very quietly 
very con in a controlled way, I tell you what I want you to do. I want you to help me to go to Switzerland and have euthanasia. I'm not going to live with this bag. And he had a girlfriend that loved him and he didn't care. I'm not going to live with this bag. So I don't want to die in a messy way. I want, don't want to just commit suicide. I want to go to Switzerland so they can put me to die and take five of my organs so I can donate my heart, my lungs, my pancreas, my liver, my kidneys. I can save five lives. Would you help me to do it? And uh, I said to him, I, I really respect your wish, uh, but it's actually practically suicide. And my approach to suicide is, first of all, can we postpone it a bit, you know? Because suicide is one of the things that's better to do tomorrow. If you want to procrastinate something, procrastinate that. Because you never know what will come your way to help you. So, um, um, he agreed to have a bit more time. And we, we uh, started to talk. And I tried all my tricks. Nothing helped. I said to him, actually, you really appreciate life because you want to donate, give life to five more people. He said, yes, but not my life. I said, actually, you practically cured. You don't have colitis anymore because you don't have the colon. And, and so you're actually healthy. You can do everything. I know it's very, very difficult to get used to this different plumbing system if you use the plumbing. But he said, no, no, no. And then God comes in, uh, works in mysterious ways. Suddenly I see near his uh, bed a pile of uh, uh, football a, a, a books and, and magazines dedicated to Liverpool Football Club. And I asked him, do you support Liverpool? And he said, he was nearly insulted and said, do I support Liverpool? You know, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, we're all Liverpool supporters. And then he asks me, which team do you support? You see, psychotherapists never tell you anything about themselves. They always ask you a question in return. Uh, so you, you can ask him, why do you ask the question? You want to know more things about me, etc." But I long ago left this approach and I said to him, listen, I can tell you that, but it's very, very risky because we might lose our therapeutic relationship. And so I really hesitated whether to tell you this. He says, no, 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 I want to know, I want to know. I said, listen, it's really serious. I'm going to lose as a patient. I don't want to do this. No, no, please tell me. I said, all right then, I'll tell you. I said, listen, I come from Israel, from Tel Aviv, and there were two teams in Tel Aviv a Maccabi Tel Aviv and a Poet Tel Aviv, and a Poet Tel Aviv had a red shirt, a Maccabi had a yellow shirt. I supported a Poet Tel Aviv and even played in the children's group a team, and a, we called ourselves the Red Devils. So actually, if you support a Poet Tel Aviv in Tel Aviv, you support Manchester United in England. Yeah? So I, I said, I'm really sorry, but from being seven, I support Manchester United. So, so uh, the arch rivals of Liverpool, and you would think it will end our therapeutic relationship, but actually it made it deeply better because what I did, I came to him every day and spoke with him only about football. And, uh, and uh, thank God that the Royal College of Psychiatrists didn't have a CCTV to record my talks because they would, they would uh, take my license away. But at some point I told him, listen, now I know why you cannot commit suicide. And he says to me, why? I said, listen, if you commit suicide, you are not a genuine Liverpool supporter. And he looked at me quite shocked. And he asked me why. And I said, you have the most amazing support song ever. You never walk alone. You can see it here on the slide with this moving song that they sing every time Liverpool goes on the, on the pitch. And we have glory, glory, man united, this stupid song. And uh, sometimes I have goosebumps when I hear it. As a Manchester United supporter, uh, when I hear the Liverpool uh, 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 supporters singing, I said, if you commit suicide, Liverpool will walk alone without you. You abandon Liverpool. And I said, also, in 2006, you were against AC Milan in the Champions League final, and you were 3 nil down at halftime in Istanbul. And then... Gerald scored the first goal, 3-1, 3-2, 3-3. You survive extra time. You win all penalties. And if you compare life to a football match, 90 years, 90 minutes, you're 21. So it's like Liverpool giving up on the game after 21 minutes. That's not serious, you know, as a Liverpool supporter. And I don't know if this is the thing that helped, but 
if you think about it, it's putting things in proportion. It's showing who, who you are. Yes, you have a bank, but you're also a Liverpool support. You know, this is... Uh, and also, the hope and the fact that he's, he's not alone. Another uh, story was a, a young man who was hesitating whether uh, to go uh, 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 for a, a, a stomach bag or a pouch. He had a very difficult ulcerative colitis at the age of 18. He had to have a surgery. And he actually uh, initially thought that he wants a, 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 a stoma because having another operation and three operations to create the pouch, I don't have to tell you what it, what it means. Uh, and um, he, he, um, he, he decided to have the, the stoma bag. Interestingly, he had a dream after that, where he goes to the changing room in the swimming pool, uh, and he has a bag, and he's deeply embarrassed, and, and his, his uh, friends are a bit shocked by this uh, bag, and this dream led us to actually explore his feeling about the bag, and actually he said, I think it will be difficult to tolerate, uh, and I prefer to go for the pouch. And then he went for the pouch. Then I discovered that this guy is crazy about rappers. And he actually interviews all the rappers that comes to the UK. He started it from the age of 13, and he has a documentary of nearly 30 hours with interviews with the best rappers in the world. And he's an encyclopedia for rappers. Now, actually, the work was, and he's now studying documentary films, and I hope he's very successful. And we started to speak about his films. And then I had this crazy idea, and I asked him, did anyone did a rap about IBD? Because they do raps about everything. And he said, I don't know. I Googled it, and there is a rap about IBD by this guy called K-Dub, that he's an IBD uh, patient. If you want to cheer yourself up, uh, uh, especially this corona period, Google it, K-Dub, got that IBD, YouTube, and you'll, you'll hear it. And again, in this uh, uh, rap, there is this sentence, IBD is something that you have, but it does not define who you are. Exactly what I think is the essence of, of the cyclical world. Another proverb that is very important, Chinese proverb, tell me I'll forget, show me I'll remember, involve me, I'll understand. So, Involvement is really, really important. So many times, you know, our doctors tell us, do that, do that, do that, but they don't involve us fully in what's going on. And the involvement is really, really crucial. Also in the psychological treatment, to, to involve people with, I think that maybe you suffer from this and this and that, what do you say? It's always mutual. It's always two mice, two mice in a cave. Uh, the last slides, um, uh, many, many uh, gastroenterologists or, or sometimes said to me, I'm afraid to speak with patients because I'm afraid to open the Pandora's box. So I'm, I'm comfortable in speaking about the disease, but to ask, how are you at home? How do you feel? How does it affect your relationship? How does it affect your socializing? How do you feel with all this? I don't want to open it because I don't know, I, I won't be able to deal with this. Actually, I say always open the Pandora's box. Because by the way, Pandora you know, was curious. She opened the box that she was told not to open. All the bad things were there. But actually, the, the, the last thing that was there in the box was hope. So hope comes to the world. You can't access to hope if you don't open the box. And I'll end with this. Uh, I don't know if you have any idea what it is. I don't know. Okay, uh, when I asked people, uh, they said it looks like, uh, uh, when I first saw it, I saw it actually in an exhibition in Manchester about black and art in, in black and white in art, where I went there to do a course in special psychotherapy for IBS. And it looked to me as a candle in the wind, you know, as a light at the end of the tunnel, something very spiritual. Then I found out that this is a work of Anthony Gormley, who created the, the Angel of the North that, that you know is in Newcastle. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, painting, also combining the 
the psyche with the, with the, the heaven and earth, the psyche and the body. And, and then I came close to this uh, work and looked closely at the title of it. And it's from a, a series of works called Body and Soul. And this work is entitled Asshole. So actually, this is a print of the asshole of Anthony Gormley. So he actually uh, sat on paper, put ink on his bottom, and this is, uh, and I actually love this image because this brings the asshole its spiritual uh, 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 aspect. You know, Professor Phillips, if uh, people uh, in the past knew him, used to say, try to hold feces, uh, water and air in your hands, and try to separate the water from the feces and, and the air, yeah? He says, you cannot do it, but your asshole can do it. So uh, the asshole has two, two sphincters, the internal sphincter that is involuntary, the external is voluntary, and does this amazing work uh, of, of controlling this, and without this, we will be dead. Actually, if you're constipated, this is the light at the end of the tunnel. So speaking about shame, why an asshole is a curse? You don't say to someone, you're a neck, or you're an ear, or you're a nose, but an asshole. I think we need to go on a campaign to redeem the asshole from its dirty connotation. And I'll end, I'll end with this prayer. Actually, in Judaism, they really did something to redeem these lower parts from their dirty connotation. And actually, there is a prayer that every uh, Orthodox Jew needs to say when he goes to the toilet. And it's called the bathroom prayer. And it goes like that. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who formed men with wisdom and created within him many openings and many hollows, cavities. It is obvious and known before your throne of glory that if one of them were to be ruptured or if one of them to be blocked, it would be impossible to survive and stand before you, I like the brackets, even for a short period of time. Blessed are you, Hashem, who heals all flesh and acts wondrously. I call this blessing holy shit. That actually, uh, to bring these parts of the body, their spiritual aspects, it's actually, I don't have to tell you, when everything suddenly works and the pouch is not inflamed and you have a good bowel movement, you thank God from this, for this wonder and, and the miracle of the pouch that was invented in St. Mark's, actually, as far as I know. Um, so, um, I think I think um, there's there's a lot to do to do about it to 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 take the shame and the dirt from these parts of the body. Okay, so thank you very much I, for listening. Uh, sorry for the interruption, and maybe I went a bit over time, but I personally have time for all your questions, so I'm not limited in time. But uh, I know I run a bit over time, so um, I, I hand it to you uh, and. Looking forward to your comments or questions or thoughts. Uh, 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 Gary, am I on? I'm on, yeah, thank you. Um, Yoram, that was absolutely fascinating. I could listen to you for hours, uh, and I'm sure I'm speaking for many people here uh, in that. Uh, uh, another fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you. What I'd like to do, because we've run over a little bit for time, I'd like to still um, uh, on a the promise of, of questions and comments uh, from the audience. So what I'd like to do is beg people's indulgence for another 15 minutes of your time, if that's possible, um, to, to put forward some questions and comments that have come in from the audience during your presentation. So is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so the questions and comments are broadly divided into two areas. One is the, the topic of the link between psychology and people's illnesses and uh, mental approach to the, the process of uh, the, the operations that they've been through uh, and ongoing challenges with, with inflammation. Yeah. Uh, and, what, but what, and, and that's really important to get to. But the second one is very specifically about how do they access your service? Is the service available just to patients at St. Mark's? Um, do you have a private practice? So those sorts of practical questions about how people access your service. Now, hopefully that's a relatively short answer and then we can get on to the other stuff. But okay. for the people who've asked that question and for other people who may be interested, that's a very important question to answer. Joram, could, could you stop sharing your PowerPoint now? Then we'll be able to see, uh, okay. see you. <laughs> okay. Okay.
There you go. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, regarding the second question, uh, so um, anyone can be referred to the psychological medicine unit at St. Mark's, um, and we receive actually a referral from all over the country, uh, and the referral preferably needs to be via the GP uh, or um, the, the gastro consultant gastroenterologist. Uh, what what will happen after that is that we apply to the uh, CCG for funding for the for for the therapy. So so um, uh, this is unfortunately the bureaucracy due to the NHS having this internal market. Uh, so then uh, this, the the CCG will approve or not approve funding the the service. Sometimes they they suggest that the patient will be referred locally. And then I need to argue that actually local psychiatric services are not always th the best for our patients because the therapists don't speak this psychogastroenterological language. And the advantage of them being at St. Mark's is that they can liaise with a consultant gastroenterologist, the dietitian, we can sometimes sit together in the same session and so on. So then we apply for funding and there is a, 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 um, a simple and a complex package. So many times the CCGs actually fund six sessions, which sometimes is enough, but many times we need more. And then we apply for more funding from a, for a complex package that it's for at least a year or even more. I still succeeded to support people for three or four years, but uh, now the, the, there's, there's because we are quite a small team, we need to have a better turnover, so it's hard to balance it. But, but this is really the process, and we can always uh, argue for more sessions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and regarding the, the private practice, so, so yes, uh, I, I, I see patients at Trust Plus uh, um, in, in the hospital privately, sometimes uh, if if the waiting list for the treatment is is too long, and then we can embrace them back to the NHS. Um, um, was there another? another no, that's, I think so. Just to summarise, referral from your GP. You don't have to be a patient through St Mark's, and there is also the opportunity for private uh, consultations through Trust Plus. That's that's the summary. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. I'm going to um, uh, gently steer you along because there's so many questions and comments. Uh, so hopefully that's addressed uh, the questions about accessing uh, your service. Uh, now let's talk about the psychology. A number of questions come in, some very personal. Uh, yeah. My own journey, and we talk about a journey in Pouch World because of course it's quite a complicated journey. Um, but some very specific comments. So um, are there psychological traits that generally generally characterized people with IBD. Um, I'm not going to talk about pouchy specifically, I'm going to, uh, unless there are some specific pou uh, pouch related yeah. uh, traits, but more about IBD, I suspect, that aren't common with other people. Yeah, yeah. You see, I'm, I'm very uh, careful to say that there is, because the truth is, I don't know, and from all the people I've seen, I cannot identify on an experience level that there okay. is a certain type. Okay. A, a IBD in the 1950s was the psychosomatic illness mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the 1950s. There are all sorts of theories. A very controlling mother also is quite common, common among Jews. Mm -hmm. the, IBD. So the Jewish mother, um, you know, is, is infamous for being very involved and controlling. And so there were all sorts of theories. Mm -hmm. that I don't think really hold water. Um, they, they try, for example, in, in heart disease, uh, uh, they speak that there is a, a relationship with type A personality, mm -hmm. people who are very driven and yeah. very competitive and have a suppressed hostility. Mm. In, cancer, in cancer, they spoke about type C that you always put 
others before yourself and mm-hmm. I'll be I, I'm careful with this I don't I don't think there is a certain time mm-hmm. there is the big question regarding does stress cause it yeah I think it's multifactorial I saw people that um, uh, there was no stress and it just appeared and people that you can really identify a stressful event uh, for example there was a, a child that his mother abandoned him in a big shopping mall because she was angry about him at the age of nine and he couldn't find her for three hours and the day after that he developed his explosive career that was the beginning of his IBD mm. so they found out let's say in, in monkeys that if you separate the monkey from his mother these monkeys from the Columbia jungle developed IBD but uh, in human beings they couldn't really identify a one-to-one direct link there are all sorts of theories that stress makes the gut more leaky change the gut microbiome changes the immune response and I think that my way of working with this is really to redeem us from blame so this but to work more in an attitude of trying to understand what are the factors that affect it yeah so some people will say because then if you say stress causes ibd people start to become stressed about being stressed mm. and then it's another stress i shouldn't be stressed the stress yeah. is a fact of life yeah. i'm a bit stressed here that i went over time but yeah. whether this stress will become distress is dependent on how will i perceive this stress yeah. like, Oh my god i went over time i said okay yeah. happens let's make the best out of it you know yeah. sort of thing yeah. so i think uh, the answer is that uh, it's really individually work with the person and to find out what actually makes it better and if somebody actually realizes if i'm more physically active if i do more mindfulness if i actually change a bit my approach i notice that um uh, I have less symptoms yeah. or so actually I need to express more my anger actually mm-hmm. and but I, I I didn't identify a certain type I think people are so varied that I would be very careful to say you have an IBD yeah. personality yeah okay okay that's good we're going to move on uh, from that so uh, just to build on it but just one observation I make, and it's made with humor, which I think is very important, um, but it's not so much just the stress, it's how people deal with it, and some people internalize it, and I think that's a key message uh, you're making. And I think on the yeah. Red Line Group Committee, uh, absolutely wonderful people that I work with, we've all acknowledged a little bit that uh, we tend to be a little bit edgy, and um, mm. that may be a trait uh, of uh, IBD patients, I don't know, uh, please don't write in. Um, the question whether the, the, the edginess came after having IBD or before yeah, that? Maybe, maybe, but it, there's a very important point to it. And, and it's yeah. this, and it, it refers to one or two of the questions that have come in. You know, one of the risks that we have, an ongoing risk that people with pouches have, is uh, the risk of pouchitis. It's an inflammation uh, of the pouch, just as occurs in people with, with IBD. And... Um, one of the questions is uh, how can we best approach a psychological uh, uh, sort of being um, if there are ways to try and reduce the risk of things like pouchitis affecting us uh, yeah. from your experience are there any things that you would recommend to people who uh, look at their whole body and their whole person holistically as you've, yeah. you've mentioned uh, with a way to um, addressing the way they are and the way they might reduce their risks yeah so again because these are the body is so complex so to say this will less will make you more prone less or more prone to pouchitis is mm. is is quite risky to say mm. at the same time there are many things that actually support our immune system and uh, and actually um from the psychological point of view actually i always say you need to be humble but um i think uh, when if you remember this painting of uh, the angel holding uh, uh, jacob i think the approach 
And when you say about being edgy, it, it reminded me like, uh, you know, you, you have so many dangers all the time. So you're hyper vigilant and then, you know, again, you know, it's, it's a bit an element of being a bit post traumatic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the approach, I call it compassionate curiosity. Mm -hmm. So when something happens, instead of saying, oh, what's going on? Why did it happen? Well, to go into an approach of, okay, this is what's happening. Let's see what, hap what, what has happened. How can I deal with it? How can I? So this, this attitude, I personally, what helped me during the last, uh, I, I, like I said, I, I started to do Tai Chi and Qi Kong and this uh, uh, Chinese martial art, which is also meditation in movement. And in Tai Chi, one principle is to be grounded like a mountain and flowing like a river. Mm -hmm. So your, your lower part is grounded, your upper part is very flexible. Because if you're very rigid, they can push you very easily. So if you take it psychologically, what helps is really to find something that you can ground yourself in, in, in times of, of turmoil. So to say, okay, there is something that we can do about it. And I'm supported. And, and uh, 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 there are the medications. And I had parchitis in the past. It passed. Okay. Something that can ground you, it can be anything. And then if you have this internal grounding, you can move with the waves of what's happening to you, but you don't fall. So you can break into pieces, but you don't fall apart. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And also the last thing is really to identify what uniquely makes you stress. So for example, I have a patient with IBD that during this, this corona, became very anxious about having an infection. Mm -hmm. And he realized that when he's more stressed about the corona, he started to wipe too much mm -hmm. his, his shoppings, he started to feel his stomach, mm -hmm. so, so uh, his intestine. And at some point he said, I need to, in order to protect my gut, I need not to be so obsessive about this virus. And he made a decision. I'm not going to wash 10 times. I'm going to wash one time. And this actually made his, that symptoms better. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated because sometimes you can have IBD with IBS and you don't know what's the IBS, what's the IBD. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to summarize it, I, I think it's to develop this compassionate curiosity, not try to fight with the symptom, try to embrace it and understand it, being curious about it, be gentle with it and to identify the unique stressors that you feel, you know, makes this worse, and then maybe try to find ways to talk with this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, get it completely. And if I, if I can just indulge everyone for a moment um, with a personal story, I have a twin brother, identical twin brother. Uh, he, uh, he's uh, funny, he's funnier than me. He tells funny stories, he's more popular than I am. He's about a quarter of an inch taller than me, which if anyone knows what identical twins are like, is a disaster for me. Um, and he's less edgy than I am. He's less tense than I am. I mean, I hate him. I hate him, let's be clear. Uh, but, you know, he doesn't have IBD. He's never had IBD. And uh, I think there's something in that a little bit. That's a personal reflection. And as uh, uh, um, Yoram has said, it, it's, it's, it's not unique. It's, uh, sorry, it's not, uh, it's not for everyone. But... I want to probe one other area that moves on from this, and that is uh, the trauma, the journey that people with pouches have had and which they live with and which uh, uh, involves uh, a number of surgical procedures for most of us, I think, in the past. And obviously um, uh, coming to terms with a, an illness about which we could do nothing about. And uh, that, that, uh, the word trauma has been used by Grace on this, on this uh uh, chat function and I think it's shared by a number of people we certainly hear it a number of times and I wonder if you had a reflection on first of all whether uh, the traits that you see in some people some people uh, who've been through this journey are, are related to a feeling of trauma or post-trauma uh, syndrome and secondly whether there's anything that you we can do um, in particular to overcome these uh, feelings of uh, trauma that we've been through and be more positive about the forward journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
this is really, really an important area. Uh, so the word trauma comes from the Greek word wound. So definitely in IBD and surgeries, you've been wounded. It also comes from the word trauma, which means a mark. So mm. you've been marked by something. Before you know it, suddenly you have it. Mm. Uh, also the word tremor uh, comes from it, and also the word tremendous. So something beyond the ordinary. So all of this mm. can be linked to the experience of, of the IBD and this surgery. Mm. Uh, the experience of the IBD is traumatic. Suddenly, out of the blue, you have this. Uh, then the surgeries, uh, and uh, for example, I had a patient that had a, a, a really uh, acute flare-up, immediate surgery. He was not being able to prepare himself for this. And he had to have another surgery, and he became absolutely avoidant of doing the second surgery because he, the, the first surgery was so traumatic to him. Yeah. I think with trauma and with post-traumatic stress disorders, it's actually the alarm system of the body, the autonomic nervous system that wants to warn you from this danger. So you cannot really approach it only with rational ways because the body, the watchdog of the body says to you, don't go there. You know, it's dangerous for you. And trauma is in the body. The body remembers it. So, uh, first of all, to deal with trauma, you need to calm the body. Because if the body is calmer, the brain gets less uh, uh, signals of fight, flight, freeze, or is less petrified by this. Yeah. And this can be done by many techniques. Relaxation, hypnotherapy, talking through the trauma. Uh, in psychotherapy, giving meaning to the trauma. Mm. Because... If you have, this is horrible, you'll avoid it. But maybe there is a way to change the meaning of it. And also, there is a certain uh, treatment called EMDR, which is called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. For example, I, I had a patient that developed a flight phobia after creating a stoma. Mm. Everything was fine, yet colitis didn't go for the pouch, he went for the permanent stoma. He uh, uh, stopped flying after this. And it caused a lot of problems because he and his wife were amateur painters and they were going all over the world to paint. And suddenly he cannot go. Yeah. And it took me time to find out what was the fear. The fear was that the bag will detach on a plane mm. and everything will be spilled down. And then we looked at the, what happens to the bag during the, the plane taking, uh, so it inflates a bit, it then deflates, all sorts of things. But it didn't help. And then I asked him, did it ever detach? And then he told me that after he went out of the ward, uh, down the stairs, uh, suddenly detached. And these three nurses came and saw him standing in his feces. And he was a very pr proud man, an elegant man. And this moment was inside him. And he couldn't forget it. So what we did, we did this EMDR, was what you do, they, they, they found out that if you focus on a traumatic event and you do a bilateral stimulation of the brain, they still don't know how it actually works. It mm -hmm. reduces the intensity of the intrusive traumatic memories. Mm -hmm. And we did this, and after six weeks, we received the postcard from Barcelona. He just <laughs> so, so, so Very so, good. So trauma, in my view, is key yeah. to what people go through. Yeah. Again, if you're not alone, if you're with the other mouse, if you are being involved, if you are being prepared, yeah. which is not always the, the case, uh, uh, and you have the support. So I was working as a psychiatrist in the Israeli army. People who had their peer groups during the battlefield mm. were less uh, susceptible to post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I, I totally get that. And I think uh, one of the things that Red Lion Group and um, uh, Kangaroo Club, are they, they're the only two players, as far as I'm aware, uh, in the UK do, is when we get together, we offer the opportunity for people to speak about their experiences. And one of the key findings uh, from our information days is that people get a tremendous sense of support by being aware that maybe for the first time for some of them, 
and they're not alone. A lot of uh, their symptoms in particular, but their feelings as well, are shared by other people. And I think that's a great support for many people who need that sort of support, who, who uh, value it. And uh, uh, do, you, do, you, do you see that as a very positive role in people's acceptance of um, the, the psychological challenges that they have from um, the, the, the pouch journey they've been on? The support. The support. Yeah, the, the feeling that they're not alone, talking to other pouchies. I think this is absolutely crucial. Mm. Crucial. It's like the second mouse in the, in, in the cage. You know, mm. interestingly, I, I couldn't put all the slides, mm. but if you go to Psalms, to the, to the Bible, mm. uh, uh, Psalms 22, uh, I don't know if I pronounce it rightly in, in in Hebrew, it's Tehillim. In, 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 in English, it's Psalms. Mm. King David says, God, oh God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah? Uh, which actually Jesus quoted on the cross. In line 14, there is a, 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 an amazing description of what happens in the body of David when he's abandoned. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm poured out like water my bones are out of joint. My heart made, melted like wax. It melted into the midst of my bowels. So everything goes into the bowel, interestingly, uh, uh, when you feel alone. And then in the other zone, uh, uh, zone 23, there is this wonderful sentence that I mentioned. Even if I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you are with me. Mm -hmm. So if you have a companion in the valley of the shadow of death, you're not alone, you're better. You're also better physically. Yeah? So I think this is crucial. Yeah, yeah, they're very good. I think that's shared by uh, everyone on the committee and we're, we're delighted to facilitate that. Yeah. Um, let's talk, talk a little bit about uh, shame uh, because yeah. you mentioned that and I think it's a, a very, very common feature for many people uh, with pouch uh, uh, issues and with um, uh, IBD is this, this sense of shame and um, I wonder if there's advice any uh, when you see uh, people in your clinic with uh, who, who feel this burden very strongly yeah um, and I think we, we had one one gentleman uh, at an information day three four years ago who had profound shame at the the, um, the soiling of his uh, uh, the bedclothes at night and uh, that his wife is the effect on his wife that he yeah, should yeah. know and he, and he really was deeply affected and it affected us all i think to hear him is there any is there any way that you advise people to address this feeling of shame or, or yeah. Uh, yeah. of any yeah. of any episode whatever it might be yeah yeah, yeah. What so, first of, so, so first of all you cannot get rid of feelings mm -hmm. so feelings happen like the weather Mm. So to say to somebody, oh, you shouldn't be upset, or you shouldn't really feel shame, it's, mm. it's useless. Mm. Because, because it happens. Mm. Again, the fact that I feel guilty doesn't mean that I am guilty. Mm. So it's to accept the feeling, to accept the feeling of shame, but not to shame yourself. Yeah, yeah. So always bring the bar barrister of the defense to the internal court. Because in a way, you feel so guilty for this. Mm. And I go back to this sentence of unpatched, and shame is something that you that should reserve to, to think that you chose to do, not the things that happened to you. Yeah. So these are, are not in my control. Yeah. So to replace the shame with embarrassment. Okay, I, I feel embarrassed about it, but it's not my fault. Shame is all and sort of an internal condemnation, yeah? Mm, yeah. Uh, David? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I Hello? It. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 you froze a bit, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry, that's my no, idea. No, so, no, no so, so I'm saying that mm. uh, sometimes this shame is, is like self-condemnation, you know, you say, yeah. and, and how to avoid that, how to say, okay, it happened, I feel shame, but I shouldn't shame myself. This is one key strategy. Yeah. Another strategy, which is very important, is humor. Yeah. Uh, if I have a patient with a pouch that is devastated by flatulence. Mm -hmm. 
and he is sure that people smell mm. and and I actually I said to him, listen, I'm sitting with you for so many hours. I never felt it. But also, I use this joke. I, there is a nice joke about flatulence, and I'll, I allow myself to tell you this. There was two, two, two men that fart. They speak about their farts, yeah? So one guy says, you know, it's very interesting. My farts are very loud, but they don't smell at all. The other guy says, it's very interesting. My farts are very quiet, but boy, they smell awfully. <laughs> The third one, the third one says, my farts, is very interesting. They are very loud and very smelly. <laughs> and the fourth one says, uh, you know, it's very interesting. My farts don't make a noise at all and they don't smell at all. So the three of them look at him and say, so why do you fart? <laughs> What's the point? It, if you don't make a smell or don't make a noise, what's the point? So if you think about children, you know, many of them enjoy it, you know, they enjoy it. And actually, secretly, when we fart to ourselves, you know, and there's nobody around, we can be quite curious about the smell. What is it? What did we eat? We're not disgusted by it. So I think, I think, I, I think, you know, the good thing about humor is it put things in proportion, you know, so actually, okay, so I farted. So I sold it. Oh, it's very embarrassing. Mm. Mm. But, but is it even the word? So I know it's hard. It's, it's hard. It's not, I think, for example, the Jewish humor is not about, it's about a warmly embracing a painful thing. Yeah. So, so yeah. you don't try to get rid of the pain, but you wrap it up with, you know, what can I do? So, uh, but, but also, then is the, the psychotherapy, also the individual journey. You might find that somebody that is so ashamed about soiling his pants has a memory from childhood. Yeah. Where, where this happened to him. And somebody looked at him and said, what do you do? And this is the trauma. Mm. It actually amplifies what happens now. So sometimes we go back to the past and try to address that in order to be less tense about it. Yes, so. Okay, um, listen, that's a great answer. Another great answer with another great joke. Um, I'm very conscious of the time and uh, we could go on for, for a, a much longer, I'm sure. Uh, but I've already indulged the audience and yourself for another half an hour. So uh, thank you for that opportunity and thank you to all who've stayed on the call. Uh, we'll wrap up now and just to uh, uh, make a couple of acknowledgements. There was a question asked, uh, this, 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 uh, this uh, presentation will be recorded and will be available on the Red Lion Group website, which you can access through pouchsupport.org. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Inspector for another fascinating uh, presentation, uh, really enjoyable, really great, and thank you so much. I'd also like to thank my two colleagues, Gary Bronzio, who's the techie who presses the buttons and is brilliant all round and also Christopher Brown, who arranged this uh, and set up this webinar. So thank you to you both uh, for your time. Uh, uh, just to say, we've got two more uh, presentations in the webinar series. Uh, next week we have, um, I think Zara, let me just check my notes. Zara Perry-Woodford, uh, who is the lead nurse uh, at St. Mark's, uh, dealing with pouch and stoma care. And that's on the 11th, so a week from now. And then a, a week further on, we have Professor John Nichols, who many of you will know uh, very personally, uh, who uh, was the head of um, uh, gastroenterology at St. Mark's, fabulous guy who pioneered uh, the surgical techniques that led to the pouch. So that's uh, all the details are on the, the Red Line Group website. Um, and um, please, do, please do access the website. Uh, but for now, thank you again. Um, you're um, absolutely you. fascinating. Thank you. And, and uh, you actually made me curious. I might join the, the seminars as well as from the audience. So. Well, we'd have de delighted to, to uh, have you join. And thank you once again on, on, on everyone's behalf. Thank you for another well, thank great Thank you all. Uh, hope, hope we'll be able to do next time in person. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. lovely. Bye-bye, everybody.